Glad to have uh, Chris Elmage and Kyle Watkins with me uh, today. Uh, with all that's been going on with uh, in our society in uh, Georgia, in Central Park, and also in Minnesota, I felt like it was time that we have a discussion about racism. Our uh, Assemblies of God uh, National Fellowship has taken a very strong stand against racism, uh, a strong perspective that we're all family. And having pastored in New York City with a congregation that uh, was born in 42 different countries, you kind of lost track of the language that people spoke, the uh, country that they were from, or the color of their skin. But sometimes that gives us a bit of a, an insensitivity to what happens in our society when there are the crimes against uh, men and women of color, uh, such as happened in these last several weeks. Uh, I want to start with you, Chris, uh, pastor at Hempstead Assembly of God. When did the issue of race become a major topic, or is it a major topic that influence in your life? Uh, <clears throat> Well, first of all, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for having me uh, even speak and, and share this part of my life, Dr. Durst. Uh, the issue of race has always been uh, something that I've, I've been aware of. Um, I would say as early as kindergarten, first grade, um, I went to school in Bedford-Stuyvesant, uh, Brooklyn. I was a part of a gifted program and I learned about black history before I learned about American history uh, at a young age. Um, and because of that, I was able to understand, you know, disparities earlier on in my life. Um, uh, because of the, the family that I'm a part of, uh, the way that my parents love the Lord and, and, and really fellowship. And, and I always had that, uh, that struggle, that tension between what I saw and what I was taught in terms of what I believe in and God loving everyone. And so... I do remember um, when I got into my teens, uh, being raised in church, that I, I saw enough, and, and, and racism has always been something that enraged me, that I, 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 I did give up the Christian belief, the Christian faith, and I, I began to embrace uh, uh, Black nationalism, Nation of Islam, um, and, and, and being a part of that group. And then that's when the Lord intervened, my brother, you know, spoke to me the word of God and I gave my heart to the Lord at his graduation at Zion. Even after I gave my heart to the Lord, this is by far the greatest temptation, tension, um, thing that I battle with well into my forties. Um, and, uh, when you see certain things like, you know, we witnessed this past week, um, it, 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 it just, it's, it's a, it's almost like a never ending rage. Um, deep down inside of me and it affects every aspect of who I am. Uh, it, it, it just, it just impacts everything, you know, and, and I wish it can just go away one day, but that's just not how it works. I, I don't think Anglo folk understand that because we, we have not experienced it ourselves. Kyle, how about you? Thank you again, Pastor Dwayne, for having me on here. I'm happy to uh, share my heart as it pertains to the subject matter, as for myself, I was raised in a single parent household. Um, my mother raised me and my three other siblings. It's four of us. We were latchkey kids as it uh, is uh, said or defined as one who, uh, a child who comes home without their parent home, uh, turns the key for themselves and uh, does their own homework, makes their own sandwiches. We were raised, um, my four siblings, excuse me, my three siblings and myself in a Christian household. My mother, although single, uh, she divorced my father at the tender age of five years old. And I knew what it was to be raised without a father, without a, uh, a Christian, if you will, strong male role model, especially an African-American male role model who loved the Lord. Uh, unlike myself uh, or unlike uh, Pastor Chris, who perhaps had that, um, that wasn't my story. And so because of that, <clears throat> my father and mother would pretty much banter as to who would have custody of the children at a certain time of the year. My mom had sole custody, of course, but my father uh, asked if he could share that opportunity. And although three of my other siblings did not want to visit my father, who at the time lived in Georgia, Marietta County, uh, I decided and opted to go and visit my dad. 
And it was then for two years, spending uh, uh, two years with my father, living there with him in elementary school, that uh, I was actually uh, called the N-word. Again, this, is, this was in Georgia. And it wasn't so much as much as, if you will, the word that was used as much as it was the anger and rage in this young man's eyes. He was, of course, Caucasian. Um, uh, this wasn't, you know, as they would use this phraseology, if you will, as a, uh, a term of endearment sometimes, as a, a way of just addressing a, a fellow brother or otherwise. And of course, I don't agree with that. Uh, I'd rather call someone my friend or my brother. Um, mm. But uh, this young man, he called me that N-word, and I, I'll never forget how it made me feel. I felt completely, uh, 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 I, I guess you can say stunned. Just the amount, again, of rage and overall hatred uh, that I saw in his eyes. Uh, once I returned back home, spending that time with my father for two years, uh, I decided to join a gang. I am a, a, a former blood member. I'm a former uh, gang member, a street terrorist, if you will. Um, and the reason why I joined the gang is because the superiors and the, if you will, uh, they call it big homies, they uh, educated us that the gangs was created to protect the African American community. The gangs were created because the police would discriminate against the rights and the protection of a black man and to to take up arms with a gang was to do what we were called to do as African Americans because we didn't have that protection so we had to protect ourselves and there's much history that has to play into that as well and there was much truth to it although not the full truth not the unadulterated truth like the word of God and uh, I was easily obviously swayed because I didn't have a, a male role model in my life I thought a male role model was a man who had power and success and money and women and, 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 and control and terrorized people by means of intimidation. Because I didn't have that male role model, I, I fed into that, uh, if you will, I fed into that lie. And that's when I joined that gang. So it was that initial N-word and, and the way that made me feel that when returning back to New York from Georgia, I decided to do something about it and I joined the gang. Mm. Uh, let me say with you, Chris, how does your relationship with Christ now impact your philosophy or viewpoint on uh, race? Yeah, that's, <clears throat> I would say that's the greatest tension. Um, because I was raised in a Christian home, um, very supportive family, my dad maintained the idea of, you know, turning the other cheek and loving your enemies and so forth and so on. By the time I was 16, uh, we weren't having that anymore. I was drawn strongly by the words of Malcolm X, uh, Louis Farrakhan. Uh, to this day, if I'm not careful, I could find myself you know, ringing, especially in moments like this, because uh, to, to, to turn the other cheek um, is incredibly difficult uh, for me uh, knowing when that is what Christ did. You know, uh, Peter had it, as far as I was concerned, Peter had the right idea of bringing a sword to the garden uh, and, and, and knowing that Jesus had the ability to call down 10,000 angels and realizing that was not going to be the plan, all of a sudden Peter changed. Uh, in, in Luke, uh, Jesus said these words, men ought always to pray and not faint. And that word faint in Greek is ekakeo. And it really means to be just self-destructive, get to a place of total destruction. My biggest tension being a child of God is knowing that we will find ourselves in situations where we would want to strike back and strike back hard. Uh, prior to my life in Christ, that's what we did. That's what we were known to do. But when we submit our lives to Christ, there's a transformation that takes place and it's a different way that we live. And so whew, I will tell you this, Doc, um, without Christ in my life, I'm in trouble. Uh, it doesn't matter how long I've been a pastor. Um, my feelings when it comes to race and racism run so deep that if I don't have the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life every single day, I can't take a day off. Uh, simply because of what that means. Someone would say, well, Pastor, it sounds like you need deliverance. I'll say, absolutely. And so does this country when it comes to racism. Amen. Um, 
but Jesus is, let me tell you, my relationship with the Lord is that constant uh, that actually keeps me uh, sane. Uh, it keeps me whole. It allows me to venture into relationships that I would not normally do on my own. And, and, but that tension is still there. I don't want you to, I want you to understand that as much as I love the Lord and as much as I love the fellowship of people, that tension is still there. Um, and, and that is something I, I submit to the Lord daily and just say, Lord, I need you. I need your help. That's part of the reason I wanted to have this conversation because I, I think that's very common across the board uh, with our uh, black community, with our black brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And I think many who are uh, white don't understand that, mm -hmm. don't understand the, the depths and the history. Uh, Kyle, your, your relationship with the Lord, how's it informed and affected your viewpoint of, of race? Pastor Chris started uh, giving Greek translations in Chaldean. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't say that to be regenerated is the word polygenesia. Mm. And when we are regenerated, it's a change of nature. Our sinful nature causes us to live, obviously, in sin. But when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ, he changes not just our mind. He changes not just our heart. He changes our nature. Yep. And that sinful nature, right? Man is deprived. Without the Lord, man is totally lost. Men, most miserable. I was reading Ephesians 4 uh, this morning, and it said, be angry, but sin not. Right. And I think that it's very important to understand that although we have a relationship with the Lord, and I do, and I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I'll never forget 1999, July 14th, uh, uh, blood uh, clicked up. I had earrings in my ear and there's nothing to say about that. Otherwise, I had a bandana in the back of my pocket. I had a chip on my shoulder. I was ready to just tear up the world. Mm. And the, the preacher that was preaching at that revival service, I'll never forget. It seemed like although the room was full of individuals, they were speaking straight to my heart. Mm. And that was God. That was God calling me to him to say, come to me, all you who are laden and heavy. And I answered that call. I lifted my hands and my life has changed ever since. Nice. I've never turned back. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. And, but that doesn't mean that we're not angry at many moments. That doesn't mean that we don't have regret and guilt and, and sometimes uh, rage. <laughs> but, but I thank the Lord for his love. I thank the Lord for his mercy and grace where I can come to him and I can cast all my cares on him, even as a pastor, even as a husband, even as a man of influence in my community, I can give it over to the Lord. And that is where I find my place, myself in a place where I'm not sinning. Amen. Where I can say, Lord, your will be done. Yes, I'm angry, but Father, I give this over to you. To so not allow I, the bitterness to take over me is to cause there to be no sin. How are you dealing with this as a pastor with your congregation then? How is your faith your walk with the Lord impacting your communication as you uh, share uh, with those in your, okay. con in your congregation. I know who they are. Uh, how, how do you explain to them what, what's going on? I would say, again, transparency. Expressing, yes, we're angry. Yes, we don't understand. Yes, at many times we're disgruntled. But the walk of a Christian is a walk that of sacrifice is to take up our cross daily, deny ourselves and follow him. And to know that Jesus wants those pains. Jesus wants those angst. He delights himself in those of a broken spirit and of a contrite heart, reminding the church that there's no shame or there's no hurt in being angry. And I'm angry, but let's not sin. Let's not become retaliating. Let's not be vindictive. Let's not be nasty. Let's not put our hands on anyone. Let's not come out of character. Let's represent Christ and be sure that everything we do revolves around Jesus. That before we answer or before we respond, let's be slow to speak, quick to listen, quick to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, even in this time. Because yeah. God is speaking. It's up to us to listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church. Chris, how about you? I'm, I know your congregation as well. I've been to Axis out in uh, uh, 
Petrog, where Kyle is. I've been to Hempstead with you. How are you dealing with it as a pastor with your congregation? Now, uh, listen, there's a lot of hurt. Um, and it's weird because it's, it's not like we, we know George, but when you see that, you, you see your uncle, you see your son, you see your brother. Um, and so I have to make sure that I am as real as possible. I need to make sure that there's an authentic reaction. Um, even at our Bible study last night, um, you know, there's a couple of times as we're doing Bible study, we have to pause because tears might come out, you know, even as I'm talking to you, you know, I'm holding back tears. I woke up this morning, you think you're okay. And then you hear something from somebody and, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, a person in Brooklyn, uh, you know, who's in office, he gave this plea in regards to what took place in Central Park. And, you know, you, you, you hold back tears. And then today I couldn't, I couldn't hold back tears. I had to go into the bathroom and, 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 and kind of let go a bit. How, 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 how am I going to preach on Sunday? You know, I could, I could really, you know, create a template sermon and talk about love, so forth and so on. But the truth is, uh, within my community here in Hempstead, with the people that would be listening online, uh, authenticity really matters. Um, it's okay to be upset. It's okay to not be okay, you know, and that's the truth. It's okay not to be okay. There needs to be um, a reevaluation, reflection, even within the community, within our families, uh, I, I found myself, before I even talk about my church, I found myself talking with my family and, and just asking the simple questions, uh, do we care for each other? I care for you. And can I say that to my neighbor? Can I say that? And it, it matters. Um, you know, the biggest issue that we're going to deal with is um, the desire uh, for retribution, the desire. And sometimes we don't understand that. That's why you see writing. And if you're not a part of it, if you've never been you know, into that, it, it'd be hard for someone to understand. But I can, I can liken that to, you know, you getting some bad news, you come into your house or your room and you, you throw something on the wall. You know, you, you know this, there's a, an overflow of emotions and it leads to this. Now, you got to imagine that times, you know, 100. Imagine that times 400 years. Imagine that. And when you, see, when you see a level of authority act in a way that doesn't seem to protect, then your initial guttural reaction would be to rebel against any type of authority to the point where, you know, it could be, it could be detrimental. And so in terms of how I need to, you know, share and lead my congregation, it comes from a place of authenticity. It comes to a place of submitting to the, the Lord. Our scripture yesterday was the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And it's like, you no, know, there's no lack if you're following the shepherd. However, if you choose to go in your own direction, you cannot expect to have a peace, a shalom. Right. And so it's like, my anger, my hurt will want me to go over here, but this is where the Lord has taken us. And we have that choice. We have that decision that despite my pain, despite my anger, I'm still going to follow the shepherd. And while I'm with him, you know, every need will be met emotionally, physically, you know, mentally. That is a, that is, that's the message that I have to deal with first as a pastor <laughs> before I can preach that. And, and, and that's where the submission comes in. And you know what? When they see me cry, that's okay. When my kids see me crying and asking and understanding, I had a brother yesterday, he was saying, we're not okay, Pastor. And I said, I know because I'm not okay, but let's pray. And so we stopped Bible study, we prayed a bit, and it does wonders. And, and I think that's where the discussion within the community, you know, really begins. I think it's important uh, for everyone to know that even the Anglo church is not okay mm. with this. Mm. White believers are not okay. Injustice is injustice, no matter what and no matter who. Mm. Um, and we're, we're not immune mm. to uh, the same kind of rage and emotion. Uh, although, well, let me not say the same, mm. but a rage right. and a, uh, a disgust over uh, the, the foul behavior of individuals. Mm -hmm. How, what do you see um, as far as the church uh, being able to do to defeat racism? What can we do together? Kyle, uh, in, in your heart, uh, as you look at the church as a whole, and not every church is as diverse as the one that I pastored or as uh, varied as many of them down in the city or, or Long Island would be, uh, 
You know, we have a lot of churches that are still very plain vanilla. Uh, what does the church need to do in order to defeat racism? I think there's an educational piece that needs to seriously be discussed that when we look at racism, we're not fighting against a person or persons per se or a group of people. Really what we're fighting against is a state of mind that, that what we're dealing with is really something that has so uh, many grassroots when it comes to our history, our American history as it, as it pertains to who we are and how we came to this point. We're looking at chattel slavery, perhaps even back, back dated all the way in those times where it was acceptable um, to have a man uh, uh, as property, to, to hold a man as a slave and to use him as property for the purpose of goods and trade and things of that nature. We're really looking at a mindset uh, of racism. We're looking at a, 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 a race that considers itself superior against another race. It's a movement. It's not just a man. And to attack a man, uh, whether white, black, or technicolor, otherwise, is, is not the approach. It's to look at the system and to do as much as we can to educate others, all, against this system, about this system, that uh, equality is something across the board. It's, it's, it's something that is to be enjoyed and, and uh, lived in by every man. And when we take our time to uh, really implement that educational piece, uh, to come against this mindset, to expose this mindset, uh, I think that's when we're gonna really begin to see the needle move. Uh, it may not take an, uh, overnight or over weeks or months or e even years. It, it, it may take a lot more time than we imagine. I'm thinking right now, man, I, I, the speech that Martin Luther King Jr. gave, the several of them that he gave, the marches, the protests, the peaceful protests, and then there's, of course, the riots. We're seeing that Minneapolis is experiencing several riots. I mean, I was just watching a film uh, or, or a video just, just a few minutes ago before this of people going into Target and looting and rioting and stealing and, and, and fighting. It's just, this is not the answer. What we need is education. We don't need retaliation. We need education. And then outside of education is we really need to pray. Second Chronicles 7.14, if my people were called by my name, would humble themselves and pray. The church needs to be praying. We need to be praying not only for revival in our churches, but we need to be praying for revival in our community Amen. that there ultimately scales removed from the eyes where people will begin to see that we're not only fighting against racism, we're fighting against fear. Second Timothy one and seven says, God has not given us the spirit of fear yes. and timidity, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Now here's what I love about that scripture. God didn't give us the spirit of fear. So fear is not only an emotion that all of us have the ability to omit. Fear is also a spirit. And I believe that we as a church have been given the opportunity by way of the Holy Spirit to, div uh, to divinely uh, discern that spirit of fear and how fear has crippled people to the point that as Pastor Chris was saying, there's perhaps black men that don't wanna go outside for a run anymore. I don't know. Maybe there's black men that are hard pressed to even approach the police or call 911 for help because they might end up being the ones who are removed or uh, uh, you know, uh, harassed or otherwise. We saw a recent video where a man who was homeless, Denzel Washington, got in, got in between the conversation between the police and this man in Los Angeles. There's all sorts of things going on and fear ultimately, we need to pray against that thing. We need to pray against that spirit. Again, God has not given unto us the spirit of fear. Well, well who gives it to us? Well, I think we all can agree unequivocally, it, it's the enemy, it's the adversary, the accuser of the brethren. Mm. But also we need to understand that things that are given doesn't have to be accepted. Things that are given, gifts, compliments, or otherwise can be rejected. I think as the church, we need to continue to lift and raise up this standard of rejection that we will not succumb to the trends of fear, but we're going to walk in faith and come against these things that exist. Nice. Amen. Chris, uh, how about you? I think two things. And... I wish it'd be that simple. Uh, <laughs> it's so ingrained in our country, whether economically, socially, whatever. But 
I, I, I firmly believe that as the body of Christ, we have the answer. I feel like an idiot sometimes saying that out loud, but it's just the truth. By faith, I know it's the truth. There's got to be a reason why I'm filled with the supernatural power of God. And there's no way uh, the power of God is going to take second place to racism. So I would say the first thing is koinonia, the idea of fellowship, the concept of fellowship um, within churches. You know, that word fellowship means to exchange with each other, you know. And so who you are is an exchanging of who I am. And together, we actually get to learn more about each other. And so and so I, I know that we can have a diverse uh, church or a diverse sanctuary but then if we're honest with each other we'd still go back to our pretty much isolated geographical areas after church uh the fact that we could come together and worship is an opportunity for us to connect in what's known as fellowship i can get to know about your italian background you can get to know about my guyanese background and that's important so i i, I cringe sometimes when i hear a, a, a brother or sister in christ who's who's white, they'll say, you know, Pastor Chris, I, I don't see color, I'm colorblind. I cringe because that so is not the answer as far as I'm concerned. Uh, being colorblind is not, no, I want you to see my color and value it. I wanna see your color and value it. There's a reason why I am black and you're not. There's a reason why you're from this background and I'm from this background. It's not to act like as if that background doesn't matter, but instead it's to learn from each other and actually improve who we are as a people that's what koinonia is right and yeah. so and so i love it like steve steve's italian he loves to be italian i'm not going to act like as if steve malazzo is an italian i love the fact that he's italian i'm from jamaican heritage right i'm jamaican i'm half jamaican and a little bit american i'm all you know so yeah i like curry goat and rice and peas you're not supposed to act like as if that's there no you're supposed to see that you're supposed to try my food you're supp i'm supposed to try your food that's the beauty of the church fellowship. And so that's number one. Number two, I would say, you know, I don't often, you know, share my emotions like that on Facebook, but I thought it was important to share that. And probably one of the things I enjoyed that made me, my tears feel real was when my, my, my white brothers and sisters started to speak up. There's been times in the past where that was not the case. Uh, there's been times in the past where there was an isolation within communities and uh, good, strong people would not say, you know, and I don't know why, but I would definitely also believe that um, the way we would handle it would not necessarily be uh, the right way as well. What I do believe is that the more time we spend with each other, the more time we fellowship, those who are in a position to actually make change will begin to speak. And I personally believe if the entire church marches when it comes to this, <laughs> I, I don't think anything can stop it. Not just a black church and a white church. And, and, you know, we tend to come together with other issues that seem to be evangelical in nature. And then we'll bypass this. No, no, no. I'm talking about if we can all come together. You know, there's a presbyter who's up here and his son loves to fish. And when I saw a picture of his son and one of his friends, I said to him, you know what? I will make sure that my son is gonna come up here and hang out with you guys as well. I'm gonna do my part and I know you're gonna do your part. I think together we'll begin to chip away at this disgusting sin uh, known as racism. Amen, amen. The beauty of the body of Christ is in its unity. Yep. When I pastored in, in Queens, we had those 42 nations of native birth I had someone say, well, you can break it up and have Spanish congregations and you can plant churches of Guyanese uh, folk and, uh, you know, African congregations and so forth. I said, you know, frankly, I rebuke you. This was a national leader. I rebuke you because we're together because we want to look like the body of Christ and all of its diversity mm -hmm. and all of its color and all of its languages and all of its beauty. And it is most beautiful when we can share together at an equal footing at, at the foot of the cross, stand on level ground and say, we're family. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's important. And I, I believe that what government cannot do, the church can do. Amen. The church has the opportunity through the gospel to impact and change the perspective on race, mm -hmm. on racism, 
on the bigotry and the bias that is there. I was raised in a, uh, really in uh, an area where there was strong bigotry as a child. I heard the words that, that you uttered or uh, alluded to, Kyle. Uh, I heard them come from members of my own family. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was part of the culture that I was raised in. Uh, I am so grateful for what happened at Bible College with some of my dear friends, but I'm even more grateful for the privilege of being at the, uh, the beauty, the mosaic of the city. Mm -hmm. um, I think the church can make a difference. Uh, Kyle, uh, kind of summing up in uh, accepting my invitation to, uh, to come on, what would you hope would be the outcome of uh, our time together as we share this with our fellowship? Unity. I'm praying for unity. I'm, I'm hoping that this means something not only to our organization, but it means something to the world uh, to see uh, three men who love the Lord who want to speak out against racism, this atrocity that exists that needs to be put in the coffin, nails in the coffin and covered six feet, if not sent straight back to hell. <laughs> mm. I'm hoping that this means something to millennial pastors who are whatever color represent whatever race. I'm hoping that this does something to other pastors, our fellow or co-laborers, if you will, in the gospel who represent leadership in the church, who would have more open, candid conversations, as Pastor Chris said, with their congregation, whether that's through a Zoom like this or a Facebook messenger or creating a chat room and just having a conversation and, hey, and say, hey, listen, let's talk about this as a church, as a church body, as a body of believers. Uh, let's have koinonia, let's fellowship, and let's, let's bear the infirmities of one another. Um, I think that's a beautiful thing. And that's why I love the church that when I said again, yes to Jesus, and I left that group, I'm talking about that gang. I've never seen so much love in my life. I've never seen so much acceptance and unity. And I am absolutely head over heels for the church. I, I believe as a shepherd, I even share uh, in some case, I, I will never know how much Jesus loves the church until maybe one day in glory. But I share that, that heart for people, for sinners, for individuals with different stories. And I love them, those stories, and I appreciate those stories. And I show no injustice or discrimination otherwise to where they've come from. Because someone showed me that same love, again, beginning with Jesus, but then with that pastor who preached and gospeled my heart. And those brothers who received me with open arms and showed me how to live a life for the Lord Jesus in discipleship through discipleship. After I gave my life to Jesus that day, again, July 14, 1999, I had to return back to my superior and tell him, I can't live this life anymore because I'm saved. Mm. And it's because of the support of those brothers and sisters, a part of the church, that I was able to get through that process and literally, completely clean and wash my hands of that lifestyle. And not have to look over my shoulder nice. and see if someone was coming after me because I had brothers and sisters to the right and to the left of me saying, nice. Kyle, we've got you. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Kyle. Chris, um, I, I know you, you may have some books that uh, folk can take a look at that may help oh, them. With it. But then what, what do you hope as well uh, from our time together? Um, authentic Fellowship authentic fellowship and conversations. I think um, this is not something that gets figured out over a day, uh, in a day or two, um, having a conference. This is, this is something that has to happen through, you know, a transformative process. And I believe the relationships that we have is the key. I think one of the best uh, um, experience I've had is, is serving on the presbytery and being able to um, hang out and, and talk with guys from other parts of New York, you know, hunting and all this other stuff that I, you know, I had no clue of until I started hanging out with them. But if, if, if I could be honest, I, I'm still very close. I'm, I'm, I, keep, I, I keep things very inside because I've been doing that for over 40 years. I, you know, my, my, my hope is that one day 
uh, the church can become a place of safety, a place where um, we can truly engage in authentic conversation, um, where we can truly embrace at the table of brotherhood uh, I, without any care what the government says. You know, I think that would always be my prayer, conversations that's authentic. I, I was never interested in missions until I met a missionary and hear their passion about missions. I could care less about missions until I met a missionary who was passionate about it. And we sat down and we got to talk it next to you. No, I was like, hey, I'm into missions. Listen, the authentic conversation, authentic fellowship that would just bring an opportunity for a transformational uh, 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 you know, encounter. That's, that's my hope and prayer. Amen. Amen. I love you, brethren. You are a gift as far as your friendship to me. Um, I honor you as men of God, as great leaders in our fellowship, and I thank you for the time that uh, you've invested here. I pray that this time together will help open uh, conversations in our churches across New York, whether upstate or southern tier, Adirondacks or in the city or Long Island. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a conversation that needs to happen, not just once, but an ongoing uh, dialogue so that uh, racism is defeated and so that our communities can be transformed by the changes that they see in our churches and the relationships that we have together. Uh, we can walk together in unity. Yeah. We can walk, and we can cover each other's back when we're uh, going through difficult seasons and difficult times. Yeah. So thank you so much. I love you. Appreciate you. You guys are a gift. And uh, we'll see how we unfold this conversation in the future. Absolutely. Both. God bless you, Doc. Thank Appreciate you. it. Bye-bye.